Hello. Uh, this is Chris Busby talking to you from Devon. I've been asked to make some comments about Australia. <laughs> um, Australia is a big player in nuclear. And recently um, there's been a, a, a proposal by some people, some scientists, you know, in, um, in Australia to uh, develop a, an international nuclear waste dump in Australia to take, according to this, one-third of existing stockpiles. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? And they're going to get a lot of money for this, of course. Okay. So, um, this was a, a report of the Royal Commission, the Australian Royal Commission on the nuclear fuel cycle, one-third of which has to do with... Uh, this possibility of of dumping a load of uh, nuclear waste there. Now I've done a lot of work already uh, on on nuclear waste dumps in Swe in Sweden, the Forsmark repository where they're going to take a load of nuclear waste from all over the place and bury it under the Baltic Sea. So I've done an awful lot of research into this issue of the um, of the uh, uh, disposal of high level nuclear waste. And what I, what I want to say here is really a message to the regulators and the scientists in Australia um, and also those people in Australia who, who uh, are considering investing their money in, um, such, uh, in the development of uh, businesses associated with the nuclear fuel cycle and that includes uranium mining and, and milling and um, exportation uh, all of those uranium projects. Uh, Australia has a very large share of the world's uranium market and when I was in South Africa some years ago there were proposals from Australian companies to come and, and dig up large areas of ta Tanzania um, to to extract uranium from from the ground there and I remember telling them, telling the, the, the people there, the um, the locals that it would be a bad idea. Now, why is it? Why would it be a bad idea? Well, in the last fifteen years, certainly in the last five years, it's, uh, uh, more and more um, research reports have emerged in the peer review literature about the health effects of internal radionuclides. Those are substances which are like uranium or strontium or, or weapons fallout material or, or consequences of. of um, of, of nuclear activities like nuclear power stations and so on these substances that get inside you and some of them can bind to DNA and of course DNA is the target for these radiation effects now all of this evidence was put together very recently by, by, uh, by me and my colleagues uh, in a big court case in London uh, at the Royal Courts of Justice and that began in, uh, in June on June the 13th, 2016, and ran for three weeks. And we're still waiting the, 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 the judge's decision on that, which has taken a very long time. But I'm not surprised, because the judges had to look at an awful lot of new information. I was the representative in this case, because the Ministry of Defence managed to persuade the, the judge in the upper appeal court to have me removed as an expert. So I couldn't be an expert. But what I did do is I brought in a number of other experts who were colleagues of mine um, and associated in some cases with the European Committee on Radiation Risk, of which I'm the scientific secretary. Uh, and the evidence that, we, that they gave in that, in that court, in the High Court in London, <coughs> will be the basis for the decision, whichever way it goes. But whichever way it goes, the evidence is so strong because it relies on other evidence and lots of scientific papers that have emerged after Chernobyl and after Fukushima that show that the current radiation risk model which uh, underpins all of the operations in Australia and in Europe and indeed all over the world relating to the nuclear fuel cycle, that this, this risk model of the International Commission on Radiological Protection is wrong by a factor of upwards of 1,000-fold. That is to say that if you get a dose of X uh, and, and they're predicting that you get so many cancers from that, actually you'll get the same number of cancers from 1,000th of that dose. And how do we know this? Well, we know this because we have been able to examine all of the evidence, all of the evidence which comes out of epidemiological studies of people who were exposed to these radionuclides. 
and the, the biggest experiment, if you like to call it that, was was the was the um, was Chernobyl, because when the Chernobyl exploded, it released a lot large amounts of these substances, which then went all over Europe and fell down with the rain and so on, and the, and then they got into uh, the parents of children. And studies were done in many, many countries, in as far away as Turkey and Croatia and Italy and France uh, and certainly the United Kingdom, where I did, I did some work on um, infant leukemia. Uh, all over Europe, wherever anybody looked, they found a sharp increase in congenital malformations in children who were born to people who were exposed to that material. And one of the most important and powerful studies was by Vertelecki, uh, where he looked at people who lived in Pripyat uh, in northern Ukraine, and he was able to measure the dose, measure the, quant the, the actual exposures. Uh, and so we know that the doses were less than one millisievert, right? And these people were, were developing two, three, four times the congenital malformation rate that existed prior to the Chernobyl accident. And of course, we also now have the thyroid cancers from Fukushi Fukushima. We also have all of the studies that have been done around nuclear power stations which show increases in childhood leukemia. And interestingly, with regard to Australia, I was an expert witness in a case uh, of a gentleman called Mahoney who had worked in the ruins of Hiroshima and developed colon cancer. And I gave evidence to, to the uh, um, Australian court investigating whether this man should should be considered for a pension or not and we won that case the court believed my evidence and threw out the evidence from our panzer from the uh, based on the icrp model so they recognized that it was the dose to the cell that's important and not the dose to the whole organ because this is how the icrp calculates dose the other thing that we've recently found is that the the the, uh, the the study, the big study on which the current risk model is based, which is the study of the Japanese survivors, was flawed because the the uh, epidemiologists who were involved in that, who were partly funded by the Americans, they threw out all of their controls in 1973. So the, so the, the original control group, which was a control group of people who were not in the city at the time of, a, of the bombing, uh, and I mean that would be a reasonable control group because you're looking at people who were outside the city and who were never never exposed. And compare them with people who were exposed at the time of the bomb. And when they found that they did that in 1973, by that time they had enough evidence to show that there was a, a serious effect. They decided to throw out that control group and to do a different study in which they compared it with the low dose group. And the problem is, as Professor Sawada said in the High Court, because he was one of my expert witnesses, he said that people who were too far away from the hypercenter, from the, the point of detonation, to have, have been exposed to any radiation at all from the prompt gamma uh, neutron flux, these people were still suffering radiation effects, epilation and diarrhea and other deterministic, you know, immediate, immediate consequences of exposure to Hiroshima. So we have the evidence from Chernobyl, from the heritable effects, and this was a paper that was published in quite a prestigious journal by, by Inga Schmitzfeuerhaker by my, and myself and Professor Flugbeil in January 2016. And this evidence was also brought into the court. And what it shows is that the, the um, error in the assessment of heritable damage, you know, congenital malformations like heart defects, like spina bifida and hydrocephalus, like these illnesses where you know they they um, they only their arm stops growing at the elbow, um, limb reduction defects. A whole range of these congenital malformations can occur or are occurring at doses, internal doses to things like uranium, <coughs> at um, one millisievert or less. So the risk problem is the the, the risk model is is just wrong. And indeed, the, 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 uh, um, the European Union has thrown a lot of money at this now and has, has set up a, an operation called Complete Con Cure, Concerted Uranium Research Europe, in order to investigate this issue. So what we know now is that the science is, is clear on this issue, that, that these radioactive materials 
cause enormous amounts of cancer and congenital malformations at very, very low doses. So anyone who is um, involved in the development of the nuclear fuel cycle related operations in Australia needs to know that first of all what they're doing if they decide to put a nuclear dump there for the high level waste is that they're condemning the future generations to cancer and congenital malformations and in, in exchange they're going to get money so this is ethically questionable and the other thing that they need to know is that the science will eventually become so clear that this will all be that this that this whole nuclear operation will have to stop it will be stopped by governments uh, un under current legislation because uh, current legislation does not permit people to develop operations which result in significant debts of, of, of members of the public and workers, which is actually what's happened up till now, but is now going to have to stop because we now know better. So there we are. Um, that's, my, that's my message uh, to the... Uh, legislators and to the scientists in Australia and if anybody wants to know more they can get in touch with with me and um, I, I'm quite happy to come and discuss these issues with people and, and demonstrate quite clearly that the science has moved on and now I have more and more uh, publications appearing myself and my colleagues in the peer review literature which 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 show quite clearly and bring forth the evidence that this is the case. So people who invest in nuclear from now on are going to lose their money. And people who have uranium shares, I suggest they dump them as quickly as possible because uranium is going to turn into sand. In fact, it'll be worse than sand because you're going to have to put, some, put it somewhere safe and isolate it. Uh, and as to what to do with what we've got so far, well, there are also various operations associated with that which are safer <coughs> and ones which are less safe. And in, in general, what we believe is that it shouldn't be buried because uh, the, these, these radionuclides have half-lives of billions of years, and we just don't know what's going to happen in the future. So anyway, there we are. Thank you very much for listening, and if anybody wants to... It's so sad, you know, it's so sad that science has gone so far astray. It's not the first time, it's not the first time in human history that science has gone so far astray, but it's probably the worst straying of science in human history in terms of its effect. Okay, see you again. <laughs>